I'm just remembering, uh, Jasmine, your website right now, and I think I have it. Uh, Jasmine Dia is here. She's a personal injury lawyer. Jasmine and I did ask the experts a couple of weeks ago, and uh, she, I wanted to bring her on the show. She's been on once before, but I wanted to bring her on to talk about personal injury law and also to take your calls if you have any questions about yourself. Maybe you think you might have a claim and you want to find out for sure. 416-872-1010. Text us at 71010. JDLawyers.ca. That's right. Okay, good. I remember that. So um, the way we started, I think, as the experts, and we were just chatting about it now, is I came at it from a point of not being 100% clear about exactly what a personal injury lawyer does and the kinds of cases you would cover. So let's talk about the traditional ones first, and then we can get into some of the other ones that people wouldn't even really think of. That's right. And I think this is a great way to start because last time we were chatting, I tried to give you the various areas that personal injury lawyers will tell you is what we do. Um, motor vehicle accidents, uh, people that have slipped and fallen or tripped and fallen due to height differential in a sidewalk. I personally also do assaults, nightclub assaults involving bouncers, security personnel. Uh, Cyberbullying is an area I do. Um, but after I left, as the experts last time, uh, the next day at work, one of my clients said to me, but why don't you talk about cases like mine? And what she meant was that I don't just do claims that fall into these types of categories. I have cases that people don't even realize would fall into the realm of personal injury or a personal injury lawyer um, uh, needing assistance of a personal injury lawyer. Uh, but there are. So let's talk about some of those. Um, so I was giving you one example earlier of a client of mine who was going to a jewelry store and she was leaving the jewelry store and she reached for the ornate door handle. It was the door handle to come in and out of the store. Yes, okay. that's right. Okay. To come in and out of the store. So she reached for that and she ended up injuring uh, her hand and wrist area. It sort of ripped open from that ornate door handle. And it was quite unfortunate because it's one of her favorite stores. And, um, you know, she comes to me and she says she was in tears because she's a registered massage therapist. And the injury was so severe to the hand that she can never return to being. Never. Never. When it comes to a personal injury case like that, is there a certain amount of time it takes before you can determine that she can never work again doing what she did because of the damage? Yes. Um, I would. I would suggest that you seek the advice as soon as you want to uh, from a personal injury lawyer. But in terms of the permanency, sometimes it takes a little bit of time because the doctors have to see how the injury heals. And, you know, if surgery is required, um, then you need to see after the surgery how it heals. Right. It could take, sometimes could take a year, two years, especially when you're talking about, will you get the feeling back? Will you get the mobility back? Exactly. And you just raised a perfect point, which is while it may take a year or two years, in Ontario, the limitation period to sue is is only two years. Okay. So you need to come and see a personal injury lawyer quickly. Get it started. Get it started. Figure out how you're doing. You don't want to fall into that situation where you aren't able to return to work. You have a permanent injury, you know, and you've missed the boat on suing because now you've really put yourself at a disadvantage. 416-872-1010. You can text us at 71010. If you have any questions for Jasmine Daya regarding a personal injury situation that you might be wondering um, whether you have a case. Now, in the case of this woman, because we're using this as an example, first of all, did she slip and fall? What happened that she cut herself on the door? Nothing. She just went to go grab that door handle. And in fact, after this situation, uh, the jewelry store has changed the door handle, recognizing that it could be a, a potential issue for people like my client. But, you know, the damage is already done for my client. And it was great that they took responsibility and they've made that change. But for my client, it's, you know, it's... It's done. So you said she's got to retrain for some other type of work because yes. she can't do that work anymore? Yes. So she is in the process of retraining, and I really commend her for her efforts in trying to figure out what she wants to do. She's uh, speaking to career counselors and figuring out what she can do at her age and with her education. 
So you as a personal injury lawyer dealing with the company that owns the store where she was injured, what are they taking care of? Right now, nothing. I mean, I have commenced a lawsuit against the company, and it's the company's insurance company that are that have hired a lawyer and are responding to the claim that I have commenced on behalf of my client. And so until we either settle or go to court and have a decision by a judge or a jury, um, my client has no funds. She has no income right now. And, um, you know, thankfully she has a supportive family. Um, and that's where, you know, sometimes you need to turn to social assistance. There are various programs that you can turn to. And again, a personal injury lawyer can help guide you and say, you know, maybe this is, a, this is an avenue that you can pursue to tide yourself over while this lawsuit is pending. Are there ever personal injury lawsuits or actions that would see the um, insurance company of whoever is being sued pay money out as you go along, or is it always a lump sum at the end? So there is something called an advance payment, uh, which you can request from the other side saying, you know that you're going to pay something eventually. So, you know, to tide my client over, can you pay something, something small? I have been doing this since 2005, and I don't know one insurer that has paid, not for my clients, and I've had thousands of clients. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. 416-872-1010. Text us at 71010. I'm not sure if this falls into your area, but somebody texted in, what obligation does a lawyer have to counsel a client whose claim is frivolous or even fraudulent? My wife had a claim against her, and she had to go through the process. So... I, I can't speak for every lawyer out there, but my firm would not handle a frivolous or fraudulent claim. And in fact, I have had a client in the past who uh, was involved in a motor vehicle accident. And I learned within a month or two that something wasn't adding up. And I called her into my office, questioned her, and um, told her that I'm sorry I couldn't represent her anymore and to find another lawyer. Did you ever figure out what wasn't right or you just had a bad feeling about it? I uh, suspected that perhaps the accident didn't occur the way she was reporting that it occurred. 416-872-1010, text us at 71010. Has something happened to you? Do you think you might uh, have a personal injury claim. Do you have any questions around that type of law? Jasmine Daya is here of Jasmine Daya and Company, and you're listening to The Night Side. Welcome back to The Night Side. Great to have you along. We are discussing personal injury law. Jasmine Daya is here. JDLawyers.ca is the website. Jasmine Daya and Company. 416-872-1010. Text us at 71010. She, we're going to talk about all of the different cases she covers, but she can talk about disability. She can talk about car accidents, how it works. And uh, before we get to our first caller, uh, just to go over the way that you work, it's free consultation. Is that right, Jasmine? Yes, absolutely. Free consultation and people don't pay until there is a settlement? That's correct. Okay. 416-872-1010. Here is Delroy. Welcome to the show. Good evening. Hi, good evening, Delroy. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I have quite a few. I called in the last time she was on, but there's one that um, that um, pops up in my mind again, right? Because um, it was um, I consulted on um, the legal clinic today, and they're telling me garbage. It started out as a landlord and tenant board um, case because the landlord locked me out and took all my possessions and um, left me homeless. Okay, um, what, what I found out uh, about uh, shortly afterwards, he, my identity was stolen, and he was one of the, um, one of the culprit that stole my identity. Um, they applied for, um, they applied for, he had more than one apartment buildings, right? Houses, he rented out as apartment buildings, right? So anyway, they had, um, he, a credit card was applied for in my name, at one of the houses that I never lived. Okay, so what, okay card, Delroy, I need you to get to the question for Jasmine. What is your question for her? The, the question is I want to go after that guy again for personal injury, right? So is that, you know, like, do I stand a chance? Um, 
Well, I think that uh, there has to be a little bit more in order to pursue a claim uh, for personal injury. So I understand the identity identity theft, um, but was there more with the landlord? Yeah, yeah. Bob. One one example. Um, he brought a dog into the into the apartment, and the dog bit me. At the time, I went to um, I went to the hospital, and I went to see a lawyer. And the lawyer said, um, uh, you know, like, um, it, I, I should come back and see him in two years, right? Because they have to prove the, um, the damages, so, right? Okay, so, so you so, can definitely sue if you've been injured as a result of the dog biting you. And it seems that you have some evidence of that with the hospital records. Right. Uh, you have to start the lawsuit within two years. So I'm not sure who you spoke to, but my advice would be to call a personal injury lawyer, you're free to call my office, uh, and we can see what we can do to help you. Okay. All right, Delroy, thanks a lot for the call. 416-872-1010. Text us at 71010. Is it as simple as saying if something that somebody else does ends up with you injured, then you might have a case? If, so, if someone, sorry? So if you end up injured because of somebody else's actions, you might have a personal injury case. Is y yes, it, it has to be some negligence. Someone has to have done something that caused your injury. And then, yes, you may have a claim. All right, 416-872-1010. Text us at 71010. You were giving me an example of a case that you did, somebody removing a fence or something like that. Can you explain that one? Sure. So I have, um, I had a client, we settled his case, uh, but I did have a client where he was walking into his backyard as he often did. And he knew his neighbor was removing the fence because his neighbor had told him that he would be re replacing the fence. Uh, but what he didn't realize is that the fence posts had been removed and had left these big holes in the ground. And so while my client was walking in his backyard, he ended up tripping because his foot went right into that hole where the fence post was. And as a result, he sustained a fracture to his foot. Um, obviously, he was in excruciating pain. Um, he had to have a cast, he had his leg up, and he worked as a plant manager. So he couldn't he couldn't walk. He couldn't be at his job. Uh, now, luckily for him, he had access to disability benefit. Uh, but the disability benefit through his work um, work insurance covered 70% of his income. And so when he came to me, he said, I know that I'm, I'm lucky I at least have this 70%, but my family relies on 100% of my income. And that's when I said, okay, let's see if we can get that shortfall, that 30% for you. But I did suggest you have a little talk with his neighbor before I start anything. Yeah, because that could create a really bad situation um, if you sue your neighbor. Yes, it's not something you want to do. But I said to him, talk to your neighbor, see if he has insurance, first of all. Um, you know, if he doesn't, then let's reconvene and, and see what you want to do. 416-872-1010. Here is Cameron. Welcome to the show, Cameron. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Go ahead with Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Quick question. The question is as follows. In order for negligence to occur, do you need proximity and foreseeability? Uh, it depends on the specific example. Like what? Why don't what, you tell us what the quest, what you're talking about? Yeah. Like, is there well, a fact it was, pattern? Is It was something I read recently and said you cannot have a case of negligence. In other words, someone does something or doesn't does something to harm you or doesn't do something they should have done, which results in you being harmed, there has to be, so I'm told, proximity and foreseeability in order to be a finding of negligence taking place. Um, I think that we have to look at the specific facts of any case before I can answer. I, I mean, that's sort of theoretical and textbook, but in it has to be a real life application. So if you have a specific what? fact pattern, I could certainly answer. What what is the Anne's Cooper test? Oh, I'm getting tested right now. Oh yeah, right. Like you know, I what I don't understand is um, why do people have a thing about personal injury lawyers? And we have a defense attorney that comes on and gets it too. Why do people have a thing about you doing what you do? Do you ever get that all the time? Okay, why? Why is that? Well, 
I guess people view us as ambulance chasers until they actually need us. And it's quite unfortunate because really personal injury lawyers are there to help people in their greatest time of need. That's when people come to me. You know, actually, that's a really good point because I have a number of lawyers who come on the show. And I will say that that's the case generally with some people. They always think badly of lawyers until they need a lawyer. That's right. And, you know, when when people are injured and they come to me and I'm able to help them and assist them and I'm actually really the only one around them that can help them, that's when they realize that we're not all bad. Let me see. Uh, let me get Sandra on the line. Hi, Sandra. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I'm so happy that uh, a, a PI is on the line tonight because I work in benefits and compensation and I see injury all the time. And I have sustained a personal injury back about in 2012. And my lawyer that I went to pushed me to settle, even though my medical um, uh, medical uh, information uh, tested that I have a concussion. And seven years later, I am still enduring the concussion and it's getting worse. And I was wondering if I can reopen that case. If you've already settled your case, that means you probably signed a, a full and final release thing. You can't go back for more. Uh, so unfortunately, no, once it's settled, you can't go back. The only way would be if there's something called solicitor's negligence, meaning that the lawyer that represented you did something that was wrong, warranting you um, being able to go after that lawyer. But I think, you know, in the circumstance that you've uh, described for us, that unfortunately you won't be able to reopen the case. Okay, thank you. All Kyle. right, Sandra, thanks a lot for the call. All right, we're going to have more with Jasmine Dia, 416-872-1010. You can text us at 71010. Personal injury law questions here on the night side. Great to have you along on this Thursday night as we get closer to the weekend. And we have a special guest in studio. Jasmine Dia is a personal injury lawyer. She's a managing lawyer at jasmineanddaya.company. Their website is jdlawyers.ca. And she's here to take your calls if you have any questions about personal injury law. Maybe you've been involved with something and you were injured and wondering if you might have a case. 416-872-1010. Text us at 71010. We were talking in the break, Jasmine, about that video that has gone viral of the guy who's driving along. It must have been with the 401. It looked like the 401. It did look it like the 401. busy highway. He must have hit the brakes, and all the snow on top of the car came right down on his windshield, probably so heavy that the wipers wouldn't work. So he's driving along with his brush out the open window trying to clear away the snow. Is that, I mean, I guess that's something where that could have gone very badly. He could have caused a very bad accident. Yes. Um, I mean, this is a, a good example of distracted driving. Um, and he's very lucky that nobody was injured. Uh, you know, with the winter weather that we've been experiencing, and actually a friend of mine just sent me a message on the way down that we're going to get 20 centimeters of snow next week. Oh, great. Yes. But with the <laughs> winter weather, we really need to be very cautious, drive slowly, um, wiping the snow off the top of the vehicle before you start driving so it doesn't fall onto the windshield. I think we need to drive with a little extra caution. Yeah. And also, I mean, look after our own vehicles and the, the distracted driving now is such a huge thing. Uh, fines have gone up and people, if you're, you know, if you're caught with your phone in your hand, it's a $600 then three day suspension and all that kind of thing. It is pretty harsh, but for good reason. Uh, there are more deaths um, from distracted drivers involved in accidents than impaired drivers. So that needs that says something. You know, people looking at their screens can't focus on the roads. And so if you need to use your device, make sure that it is connected to your Bluetooth. And you need to keep those devices stored in a safe place. The Highway Traffic Act was recently amended so that you can get into a lot of trouble if you are using using a device while driving. It's so actually, the amendment was right under uh, the Highway Traffic Act section for sleigh bells. No. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why. I find that so amusing. I'm like, sleigh bells? Uh, so let me tell you about this. If you are on a sleigh or a sled with two 
horses or two animals pulling you along a roadway. You must have two bells. That's not true. It is. It's 77 of the Highway Traffic Act. 416 <laughs> Text us at 71010. Do you get a lot of people... Um, we hear, here's the thing that, that I'm trying to find a way to say this. Unfortunately, we hear about a lot of people being uh, struck by vehicles in the city. And oftentimes it doesn't end well. It's not like there's a, any case to be, but I guess the family would. Or you mentioned that that homeless person who was run over by the garbage truck. Okay, so... Pedestrians are struck by vehicles every day, unfortunately. I mean, I hear stories all the time. And, you know, it, if they are still with us, then that individual is going to likely have a lot of needs. And so we would be talking to them about what they could access in terms of accident benefits. So through auto insurance, what benefits they could access. And there would also be a lawsuit against the driver that struck them. For someone such as the homeless individual recently that was struck by the garbage truck, um, that individual is no longer with us. So there's no need for um, any treatment needs or anything like that. Uh, however, in auto insurance, there is funeral benefit and death benefit available. So if the family incurred expenses for her for that individual's funeral, they could apply to auto insurance for benefits um, to cover those types of expenses. And, you know, people, unfortunately, are also involved in car accidents every day. And a lot of times people live through a car accident, but they suffer a lot of injury and it can go on for a long period of time. And you and I were talking about that being a scenario where you might be able to get money um, along the way because it's a car accident situation. That's right. So a car accident is very different than other types of personal injuries where you have a lawsuit. So with auto accidents, you can access accident benefits through your own insurance company. Uh, we have a no-fault scheme in Ontario. So there would be uh, funds for income replacement benefit, for example, whereas in the other scenarios we described earlier in the show, I told you that there was no benefits. You're basically, you, do, you don't have an income until the file is settled or judgment is rendered. Uh, so with auto, you, you can seek income replacement benefit through auto insurance. And there's a maximum. It's 70% of your gross income to a maximum of $400 per week. And that will last until the insurer sends you to insurer's examinations. And if the insurance doctors find that you are able to go back to work, then they're going to cut you off. And does that happen a lot? Yes. Really? <laughs> and you have it to does. keep fighting for the client. I do. I do. And it frustrates me. I have a client right now. Uh, she came in to see me today. And I was so stressed out when she came this afternoon. I was just working on a million things. And she comes all bubbly with her cane walking to my office and she was just so happy to see me and in that moment i felt so guilty for feeling so stressed out to see this amazing individual that just oh my goodness wonderful woman but she has been cut off from her uh her long-term disability claim so she had she was in a car accident she had income replacement benefits as well as long-term disability benefits so she was making 100% of her income, but her long-term disability benefit carrier just cut her off. And now she is only going to get the $400 per week from income replacement. And she said to me that she is so lucky that over the years she saved money because if she didn't have savings, then she doesn't know how she'd pay her rent. When we come back, because we have to take a break, I have a question about long-term disability, something that happened to someone I know. And I want to ask you, if um, this, she was told it was an oversight. I have a feeling it's just one of the a tricky thing that insurance companies do, but we'll talk about that when we continue. Jasmine Daya is here, personal injury lawyer. If you have any questions, 416-872-1010. Text us at 71010. You're listening to The Night Side. Welcome back to the night side. Great to have you along. Jasmine Daya is here, personal injury lawyer. We're taking your calls. 416-872-1010. Text us at 71010. 
She is a managing lawyer at Jasmine Dia and Company, jdlawyers.ca. I do have a, a long-term disability question, but I want to get this call first. 416-872-1010. If you have any questions for a personal injury lawyer, maybe you have been injured and think that you might have a claim and you wonder if it's worth finding out more about it. Jasmine is here till 930. Hey, Mohammed. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening. How are you? Good, thank you. Go ahead with your question for Jasmine. I don't know if you can hear me clearly. My, my phone connection may not be that good, but I have a question. I am seeing a lawyer right now for a, a personal auto injury, and uh, and my doctor is telling me not to go and see the doctors that uh, that the lawyer the lawyer is telling me not to go and see the doctors that the insurance company wants me to see. Oh, do they have to go? So if the insurance company says you need to see this healthcare provider. Yeah, their own doctors, like psychologists. Their own and doctors, and okay. All that. Would they be... Me, do not go and see them. Okay, would they be, J uh, Jasmine, the insurance company's doctors, or would they be third party? They don't work for the insurer. They were hired by the insurer, but the doctors work for a different company. So not they're not employed by the insurance company. They're employed by a third party company. Um, but they were selected by the insurer. So usually... Uh, you know, <laughs> they're more in, on, in line with the insurer's thinking. Right. Um, but I don't know. Um, I don't know why your lawyer is suggesting you don't go to these assessments. If you are seeking benefits from an auto insurer, then you must attend at those assessments. Otherwise, you will be found to be in noncompliance. And then they have every right to terminate your benefits. If you are concerned that those healthcare providers are siding with the insurance company, can you also go to your own and then that way you can compare? Absolutely. So um, the plaintiff's lawyer or uh, the injured party's lawyer should definitely be setting up assessments of their own so that you can counter what the insurance insurance doctors are saying, assuming that they're going to go against whatever it is you're seeking. Do you understand that, Mohammed? Like, do you get it? You could get in, you know, you could be unsuccessful just for refusing to go to see their healthcare provider. But if you don't trust that person, you can also get your own assessment done uh, so that you have record with a doctor that you trust. Oh, yeah, okay. But I, I want to know, is it beneficial for me not to go them, or should I... No, she's saying you need to go. You need to go. If they're saying you, there's a specific health care provider, you have to go? Yeah, if mm -hmm. the, the insurance company will set up assessments, usually it's because you've either submitted a treatment plan. So maybe you want more physiotherapy and your clinic has submitted a treatment plan. The insurer may need to know if more treatment is reasonable and necessary. And so what they'll do is arrange for you to see their doctor, a doctor that they've hired, and that mm -hmm. independent, supposedly independent doctor will determine if more treatment will be beneficial for you, if it's reasonable and necessary. Okay. And if I, you don't go, then the insurer can say, okay, no more treatment for you because you did not go to our assessment. Okay, thank you for that. But my lawyer, I think he's trying to change my case from minor to major. So yes. he's saying until I succeed changing that uh, category from minor to major, do not go and see any of the referrals. Is that okay? Mm, I would disagree with that, but I'm not sure if there's more that your lawyer is considering. Uh, so what uh, what Muhammad is describing is the minor injury guideline. So in Ontario, over the recent years, there has been a decrease in the benefits that individuals are able to get from their policy of insurance. So mm -hmm. at present, uh, we have something called the minor injury guideline, which caps your treatment at 3500 even though your policy has $65,000 of treatment available for you. And by the way, a few years ago, it used to be $100,000. Um, so everyone sort of, not everyone, but a lot of people are lumped into this minor injury guideline category. And then you need to demonstrate to the insurer that your injuries don't fall under that category. And so what your lawyer is trying to do is say, uh, we need to get you out of that so you can access more treatment so that you can try to get better. Um, but, you know, if, if the insurer has arranged these examinations, there's a reason. And mm -hmm. I, I'm very concerned that if you do not go, then you'll be held in noncompliance. 
Okay, Mohammed, thanks a lot for the call. Yeah, um, that alone, I think you, you need to, I guess you have to go through whatever steps they're asking you to go through. And if at any point you're not trusting that they've got your best interests at heart, you can always get a second opinion and present that. That's absolutely correct. And it's, it's quite frustrating for a lot of my clients because they're injured they just want to go for treatment or they just need to get their income replacement benefit to tide them over. And by going to all of these assessments, I mean, some insurers will line up three or four assessments for my clients and it's, you know, all day and they're already not feeling well. And if they don't go, the insurer can terminate them. So they have to go. And, um, you know, I think that sometimes the insurer's hoping they won't, you know. Long-term disability, how does it work when somebody... Um, is on long-term disability, did they have to prove annually that they still need to be on it? Do you know? So every insurer deals with long-term disability differently, um, and every every case is different. So an indiv it also depends on the injury. So if someone um, has a stroke and they have significant disabilities and the insurer is aware, they might not do anything. They might just keep them on long-term disability. Um, whereas if, if it's there's a potential for recovery, the insurer is going to check in and ask for you know, more medical evidence so they can assess. Some insurers do surveillance. I have one client, uh, she was at um, a fitness class with a trainer uh, trying to get better. And that was the day surveillance was conducted. And the insurer terminated her swiftly thereafter saying, well, you seem fine to me. And uh, l let me tell you, she's not fine. She's not fine, she's but she was trying fine. to get better. Absolutely. Do you ever get people coming into your office who... Well, you mentioned one earlier who is sort of trying to scam and you know it's not legit. Do I get those? Yeah. Uh, well, thankfully, um, I've only had a, a few and nothing recent. Um, but if I if I get wind of anything that is not right, I just that's not that's not the kind of client I have. I have many clients, hundreds of clients personally that need me and that I adore and I am there for them 100% and I can't be representing individuals that aren't legitimately injured. So personal injury law would come into play if you have injuries, um, I guess, that are that are significant or long lasting. I mean, if you're in a car accident and you walk away and you're okay, you don't need a personal injury lawyer, do you? Well, you may. So with car accidents, you can only sue for your pain and suffering if your injuries are permanent and serious. I mean, you could sue for anything, but you won't be successful if you can't demonstrate that your injuries are permanent and serious. So that's for the pain and suffering aspect. But you may need a lawyer if maybe you need some treatment. So maybe your injuries aren't permanent and serious, but maybe you do need some treatment to get you to back to where you were from before the car accident. And for that, you might need some help. All right. Jasmine Dyer, great to have you in. The website is jdlawyers.ca. Did you want to give out the phone number for your firm? Yes, it's 416-967-9100. jdlawyers.ca. Jasmine Dyer, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks so much for having me, Barb. Great to see you. You are listening to The Night Side.